in here, and we'll start the hour talking about it. What we're going to do this next two, two blocks of instruction, we're going to talk about mental preparation for the battle. Now, my book on combat, uh, the part that I've really got to cut down, thank you. Thanks, Bob. The part that I've got to cut down is this physiology part. They've taken my book on combat, and if you were going to read one book, the one I want you to read is on combat. They've turned it into online courts, the uh, Grossman Academy. GrossmanAcademy.com, three semester credit hours, talk, in service training for a lot of different professions, three semester credit hours or in service training, GrossmanAcademy.com. And they, uh, if you sign up today, Dennis, wait, wait your hand there, Dennis. Dennis, our service army, come walk them home. Walk them home. Go on. Oh, oh. Oh. And uh, they got a free t-shirt. Everybody signs up today gets a Grossman Academy t-shirt. Go up, go up. Go up, three semester credit hours. $59, big, a deal, the whole course is $59. Online course, e-copy of the book. Did I get that right, Dennis, $59? Yeah, that's correct. Right. Oh. Go All right, here we go now, back in gear. We talked about the internal threat. The kids that gave us Sandy Hook are going to give us bad, bad things in the years to come. Uh, daycare massacres, I pray that I'm wrong. But we're going to see school massacres, we're going to see other attacks. This generation will spontaneously give us things we never dreamed of. I believe with all my heart that Mexico is our future. We have brainwashed a generation to immediately take the side of the criminal. And it's bad, and you're going to pay the price for what we've done. We have a million true blue criminal gang members, and it's exploded. Mexico's our future. The only thing that stops us, Lord willing, from being Mexico, is our armed citizens. You are not unarmed peasants like Mexico. You are armed citizens. A citizen is armed. Unarmed people are peasants. They're servants. You understand that? They may think they're citizens. But they are peasants, they are serfs. You are the nobility, you are the paladin, you are the samurai, entrusted with the tools to preserve our democracy. We'll talk more about that later on. Now, we have an internal threat, and we have an external threat. When will the Paris hit again? Where will they go? Nobody knows the future. We make a pretty good shot at it. Predict future behavior based on past behavior. A serial killer Find, torture, kill the last three victims on the full moon. What do you want to bet? They'll do the same. Yes? If we can predict future behavior based on past behavior, we can take a pretty good shot of when the terrorists will hit again and where they're going. Our enemy has been around this block once before. Russia was in Afghanistan for 10 years. And for 10 years, there were no major terrorist attacks on Russia. It is their moral, sacred obligation to take them off of their turf first. Furthermore, they know if they launch terrorist attacks on Russia, they would renew their will. They would generate internal external support for the war. Their policy was very straightforward. Give the stupid Russians help in Afghanistan, wait till the idiots get tired of the war and go home, and then it's our turn. And when it became their turn, they came to murder the children. Now, folks, they're doing the exact same thing again. Now, there's all kinds of variables in this equation. It's far more complex. But if you end up back, I'll give you long odds. When the last troops leave Afghanistan, or if they think we're never going to leave, then all bets are off. When the last troops leave Afghanistan, watch out. Now, what they did to Russia was first the Nordos Theater. Some of you heard about what happened in the theater. What most Americans don't know is a children's presentation. The presenters were children, the audience was children, and when they attacked that theater, they were slaughtering children. <coughs> now, the fast land, school massacre. I'm afraid that I'm wrong, but there's a good chance to believe that's what's coming. Now, let's back up a minute and talk about what's coming down the road, folks. <coughs> they want to hurt us, they want to hurt us bad. For 13 years, we've had it our way. We've hunted them down across the planet. Whacking them with Hellfire missiles from Pentagon. Yeah? Remember the Hellfire missiles? The fires of hell. We make a religious statement. Every time we whack them with the Hellfire missile, we don't even get it. They get it. They get it. They're mad. When it's their turn, 
happens when it finally gets to be their turn, they're waiting very patiently for their turn. They're going to do everything in their power to destroy us. The minute they get a new, they're going to use it. Russia had nukes for 50 years. They never used it. Why? Because they knew we would exterminate them. It was our national policy for a quarter of a century to kill every living creature in Russia if they popped a single nuke on us, and we would have done it. That was called deterrence. It worked. Our current enemy is not remotely deterred. What have they got to lose? Oh, what have they got to lose? What are we going to do to them we've already done? As far as they're concerned, they have nothing to lose. They cannot be deterred. They can only be hunted down and killed. Now, the minute they get a nuke, they're going to use it. There may be Russian nukes still floating around out there somewhere. Uh, Pakistan is not our friend. Pakistan is a barely thin pool conglomerate of mutual interests, and Pakistan has over 100 nukes, and they're building nukes as fast as they can. Just a matter of time until the decade gets one of those nukes. Iran is scary. We think they're trying to build nukes. We know North Korea has nukes, and North Korea is nuttier than a squirrel bird. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want you to understand, they do not have a delivery system to pop it off in the, in the stratosphere and do an EMP pulse. The EMP nonsense is it's just theory, but they don't have a way to do it. We keep underestimating them. They're going to pop it off in a boat on my offshore. Can we stop every drinking dink fish and go to Mile Offshore? And the fallout always goes east. Their best bet would be to get somewhere in the Great Lakes and pop one off. And the fallout would fall all across New England. And a radioactive tidal wave would take every city on the, on, think of every city, think of a Great Lake, and every city on the coast of that Great Lake disappearing in a radioactive tidal wave. But there's unclassified data that would believe us, that lead us to believe that it's going to be tricky get one into the Great Lakes. In a confined area where we have a chance to check, it's reasonably we can detect a nuke. If they're going to do it on the East Coast, they're probably somewhere in the Gulf. And a radioactive tidal wave will take Gulf cities off the map, and radioactive rain will fall all across Georgia and Florida. Their best bet is a mile offshore of San Diego. A radioactive, if they pick the right guy, a radioactive tidal wave will take two aircraft carriers off the map. Coronado Seal Basin, all they want to hurt the seals. A good chunk of San Diego will disappear in a radioactive tidal wave, and radioactive rain will fall all across America. Folks, we have never been more likely to suck up a nuke, and we've never been less ready. They will use Ebola. We live in the age of the suicide biobomb. Infect people with Ebola, volunteers, send them across the border. Well, it's not infectious until it's a symptomatic phase. It is, you have to sex with them. Have sex with as many prostitutes as you can. A big, wet, sloppy kiss is probably to them. Go ahead, try to figure out everybody that prostitute had contact with for the last 20 days, yeah? And then when you do become infectious, you wander around and slime and spear and spit and cough in every direction you can to infect as many people as possible. Can we stop everybody infected coming across the border? The time will come when we will. Can we stop every boat a mile offshore? The time will come. Think what we did for the Cold War. Think of the distant early warning line. Think of the things we did for the Cold War. Think of the ICBMs and the missiles and the nukes and subs. When our nation finally mobilizes, when we get leadership in our nation that will mobilize us for the threat, we can do it. But if we predict future behavior, based on past behavior. <coughs> They're going to hit the schools. If they want to destroy your way of life, they come kill your kids. Folks, how many of you heard about what happened in Kenya on Easter Sunday? They came to a college and they murdered 140 kids. Yes? But how many of you heard what happened in Pakistan on Christmas? They came to a Pakistan school and they murdered 140 kids. Now, Pakistan was getting serious about clearing out some of Taliban's friends, so they sent them a message. And over the Christmas holidays, it wasn't their holiday, it was our holiday, they attacked a school that murdered 140 kids, and they shut every school in Pakistan. Folks, in 1970, Israel, the first thing Israel had was a school bus massacre. 
From that day on, every school bus had armed security. There's parts of Israel with armored school buses. There are half a million school buses in America. How do we get armed security? Half a million school buses, mom, mom. Oh, you can do it. Tell me Dana Grandpa with a deer rifle sit in every school bus in your, your state, huh? <laughs> Grandpa with a deer rifle in every school bus. We got an answer, we can do it tomorrow. But there's only one good answer to tap into our armed citizens. Our founding fathers knew we would face this kind of dilemma. They had it carved into the DNA of our nation. A Pope's uh, 1974, Israel, the Ma'alot message. They came and took a school hostage and they set the pattern from there on. The Israelis counterattacked. They didn't have time to murder every child, but they had time to shoot virtually every child. 26 dead, 70 wounded, uh, and, and, and a nation stunned their soul. 1974, Israel, Ma'alot massacre. From that day on, every school in Israel has been a fortress. Now, folks, Turkey tells us, I trained the Turkish police. And their battles against the terrorist cities in the 90s, over 300 schools were attacked. Algeria, same story, 80s and 90s, hundreds of schools attacked. Iraq, we saw suicide bomber after suicide bomber in schools, and then they used a chlorine bomb in a school in Iraq. Chlorine, they used that in the trenches of World War I. You blow up a tank of chlorine and eat your eyes and eat your lungs. Hitler, at his words, would not use chemical weapons on the battlefield. They used chemical weapons on their own girls in their own schools, in their own nation. You think they're more good for us? Indonesia, the largest Islamic nation in the world. And I pray in Indonesia, please, give me a message war. One case in Indonesia, three little schoolgirls were beheaded on the way to school. The little headless bodies were left in the middle of the trail of school, and the three little heads were placed in three different locations. As a signal to anybody that dares to take them anything other than their brand of religion. Google it. Indonesia, school girls, beheaded, they'll come right up. Across southern Thailand, and going to Malaysia, public schools are shut down indefinitely. The public schools still open in southern Thailand have armed teachers and armed parents in the school 24 7. Like Israel, Thailand's found out the only way we keep our schools open is armed teachers and armed parents parents in the schools 24-7. Pakistan, massacre after massacre, then last Christmas we saw 140 dead in school in Pakistan. <laughs> Afghanistan, in 2009 alone, we had 600 attacks on schools and school children in Afghanistan one year alone. 600 attacks on their own schools and their own kids in one year alone. You think they won't do it to us? <clears throat> I had the honor to write the forward to a book called Innocent Target. When terrorism comes to school. The author of this book is Chief Michael Dorn. Mike Dorn is the world's definitive expert on school safety. And we've outlined terrorist attacks on schools around the planet. Since the book came out, we have found thousands, no exaggeration, thousands of additional attacks. Now, Mike Dorn is a definitive expert on school safety. We outlined the things we can do to prepare for it. But Russia, when it came time for them to hurt the Russians, they came and killed their kids. Terror investment. Now, the man that wrote this book has been systematically hunted down and shut down to the best of their ability. Somebody has paid vast amounts of money to shut this man down. Somebody bought a website full of wall ninjas and goofballs, and they attacked him. Now, he claims that Green Gray is not. I've worked with him for over a decade. He's never claimed he's Green Gray. People always say I'm a PhD. I always correct him. People say he's a Green Gray. He corrects him. But folks, uh, even the goofballs on the website are saying, why are we still messing with this guy four years later? Why are we still working so hard to shut this guy down? Four years later, somebody was paid big bucks to shut this man down because they do not want us to read this book. I believe with all my heart, it's Arab money. I believe the people who are involved in that are just, just unwitting tools of the Arab money trying to shut this man down. Even the goofballs on the website are still starting to say, why are we still messing with this guy four years later? What's going on? Something's happening. They don't want us to read that book. September 1st, 2004 attack on a school in Russia. Now, folks, they caught them on the first day of school. They're all out in front. Now, a middle school in Russia is first grade through 11th grade. People think they didn't attack the little kids. They do. They do attack the little kids. They attack daycare centers. We'll talk about that later. In Kabul, Afghanistan, a daycare center was attacked last year. Daycares are rare in their culture. When they appear, they attack them. September 1st, 2004, they caught them on the first day of school. They had terrorists in place ahead of time blocking the exits to the gym. Terrorists bail out 
of vehicles barreled ahead to the kids and herded the kids like cattle into the gym. Now half the perimeter was being held by a handful of terrorists with concealed weapons. There's a time in the first 10, 15 minutes of every attack, one or two well-trained people with concealed weapons shoot the idiot clock in the action, and the hostages will escape like air out of the bloom. You understand that? They hate concealed carry. They actively fear concealed carry. They will seek the states, and they will seek the places where concealed carry is not allowed. And in most states, that's the schools. We clap and fire from the converted our children. So a thousand kids were trapped in the gym. The adult males were all dead in the first 15 minutes. If you're an adult man with a situation like this, you fight from the beginning, because you will die on your knees in front of your children's eyes in the first 15 minutes. <coughs> they spent the next three days torturing the children to death by the most effective manner, no water. Nobody in this room has gone a day without water. They went three days without a drop of water. One of the most agonizing deaths any human being will ever suffer to simply die from dehydration. Very simple. Pack the kids together, deny water, and the fourth day they're dead. One of the most agonizing deaths in human beings will ever suffer. This is a school. There's water bouncing bathrooms everywhere. The Russians were delivering cases of bottled water, and they wouldn't give them a drink. They set the bottles of water in front of the children. These are little kids, first grade through 11th grade. They set bottles of water in front of them to torment them and torture them. What's it feel like? You go for three days without a drop of water. Here's what it feels like. On the first day, they were urinating and defecating their shoes at somewhere clean. By the third day, they were drinking the 3 day old puddle of urine on top of the feces in their shoes. The little slimy sludge, three days old, on top of the feces in their shoes, they were sucking up. They were mad with thirst. They were insane with thirst. One day, and they would all be dead. But I believe the Russians knew they wouldn't give them that day. They knew they weren't going to have one more day. Now, they're listening to the news, and the news is telling everything that they want to know. They have cell phones, and people are calling them and telling them what's happened. They know exactly what's going on. <clears throat> on the morning of the third day, the Tier 1 Spec Ops was finally fully on site. Dare deal for four sales, sealed Team 6. On the morning of the third day, we're finally fully on site. They didn't have a plan that You don't just hit the ground and attack. You gotta make a plan. They didn't have the helmets, they didn't have their body armor. The terrorists chose the time to make the attack. On the morning of the third day, a huge bomb strapped to the basketball backboard went off, blasting children out the windows. Six seconds later, the bomb on the other backboard went off, hurling more bodies out the windows. The Russian Tier 1 Spec Ops had no choice to launch a spontaneous attack. Without helmets, without body armor. Without a plan, they simply charged from every direction. The terrorists had three days to harden the target. Three days to booby trap and barricade every room, every window, every entrance. It was a 10-hour room-to-room nightmare. It was a 10-hour room-to-room war. When the smoke finally cleared, 10 hours later, best land, September 1st, 2004. When the smoke finally cleared 10 hours later, they believed 49 terrorists. They believed 49 terrorists were neutralized one way or the other. They believed 12 of the 49 escaped. They had an escape plan from the beginning. They went to enormous effort to get these people out. Why? I think you make a very good argument. They will be the cell leaders for the attacks on America. 21 of Russia's most elite spec ops were dead. No helmets, no body armor. There's an incredibly courageous, spontaneous charge from every direction. 21 dead operators. And the hostages, the final count from Russia tells us, 314 were dead. The vast majority were children. Over 1,000 were hospitalized. Every single child, every single child needed hospitalization and immediate IV to keep them alive after three days of dehydration. And our nation was stunned to their soul. Is that what they're going to do to us? No, we don't know. This is what they have done to every single nation. 
they've conducted aggressive reversal. And you know what's interesting? You know Chechnya and the Chechens <laughs> didn't Russia help. But of all the attacks on lunch on Russia, this one was different. It was in large part what they call Arab terrorists. It was Osama bin Laden's guys. Why? Of all the attacks that launched on Russia, why? Were bin Laden's guys all over this one? You make a very good argument, said dress rehearsal. And Osama bin Laden flat promised us that Russia is our future. He flat promised us that Russia is our future. So we don't know the future, folks. So. But I'll tell you what I think the next line of love might look like. Some dark morning, they'll hit as many daycare centers, as many schools as they can. And they're not coming to the high school. Be ready everywhere. Why not the high school? They can fight back. All it takes is one big high school football player to blind something and they tackle you on him to hold attack. Why would they go to the high schools when the elementary schools and the daycare centers are wide open? You want a weapon of mass destruction? Fire. In Bashlam, somebody somehow caught the roof on fire. Of the 314 murdered, over 200 were killed by the fire. The terrorists were in an adjoining building, gutting down everybody that tried to escape. 314 dead, over 200 were killed by the fire. Or like 9-11, crushed to death when the building collapsed because of the fire. They then uh, uh, at 9-11, they intentionally picked aircraft at the beginning of their flight. Why? That's full of fuel. Fire and collapsed the building because the fire did most of the killing. You see a pattern here? Folks, the cartels in Mexico, the single greatest body count the cartels have inflicted was the Casino Fire in Monterey, Mexico. Shut down the fire sprinkler system ahead of time. You know where the fire sprinkler shutoff is? It's a critical component in our plan. Shut down the fire sprinkler ahead of time. Block the exits. Walk in the front door of a casino in Monterey, Mexico. Dump a can of gas, drop a match, and walk away over 100 people are dead. The greatest body count the cartels have inflicted was the fire. So I pray that I'm wrong with all my heart and soul. Not some dark morning, but as many daycare centers and many schools as they can. You want a weapon of mass destruction? Here's a weapon of mass destruction. Dump a five gallon can of gas in a classroom. Back 100 first graders and kindergartners in that classroom. From that point on, all you do is drop a match, 100 kids are dead. Roll a couple of 55 gallon drums of gas into the cafeteria. Pack 500 kids around the perimeter, soak them along with gas. But that minute on, all you do is drop a match and 500 kids are dead. You saw what they did to that pilot, that Jordanian pilot in the cage, burned to death. That's what they plan to do to our children. Fire is a great killer in all their attacks. You give them 10 minutes in their school, and 100 kids are standing in a puddle of gas waiting for somebody to drop a match. You give them 30 minutes in that school, and 500 kids are packed around the perimeter of the cafeteria soaking gas waiting for somebody to drop a match. We can't give them 10 minutes. We can't give them five minutes. There's only one good answer. Israel calls it the swarm attack. Armed citizens charge from every direction. They would do this daily to Israel. They would do it daily if they could. But they can't because Israel found the only possible answer, armed citizens everywhere. Folks, you are the devil. Think about that. Why did the Russians give them three days to torture the students? Why did they give them three days to harden the target? Why didn't the Russian police go in immediately? Because it wasn't their job. The Russian police didn't have the equipment, they didn't have the training, they didn't have the mission. Nobody expected their police to go in. They were waiting for elite spec ops to save their people. In England, folks, I trained the British SAS, the Special Lord Service, Royal Marine Commander, the National Lord. In England, the unarmed bobbies are useless. The unarmed cops are a complete and total waste of resources when this happens in England, and it will happen to England. But they've got elite spec ops, the SAS, standing by to one or two locations in eight hours. If they're lucky, by then it will be over. In Norway, that idiot got on the island. Remember the guy on the island in Norway? Oh, yeah. Every, every anti-gunner, every anti-gun right person needs to have Norway shoved in the face over and over again. One man with a rifle on an island murdered 69 people, almost all of them killed. The all-time gun massacre by a single individual was an island in Norway. All their European gun laws didn't do them a bit of good. Think about that. The greatest massacres have not been in America. They have been in Germany and in Norway. Yes? 
But the Fed said 69 dead, 120 wounded for an hour and a half in rampage through this island. The Fed said, you local disheads don't need guns. We'll be there for you. We have a leech spec op team standing by. An hour and a half later, an hour and a half later, the Feds finally showed up. Around the planet, it's the Feds' job. Or, or the leech spec ops job. In America, it's the local police. And you. It's the local police's job. We are at war, and we expect our cops to go in. We have rifle armed cops who are trained to go in immediately. And we have, we have SWAT teams who are the spec ops prepared to go in. I want you to think about this. Folks, nobody in Mexico is complaining about militarization of our police. Yeah? During the Boston Marathon bombers, when the, when the cops were hunting them down with rifles and animals, nobody is complaining about militarization of police. <coughs> Folks, I, I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart, the police are the front line of defense, and you're the second line of defense. <laughs> and people trying to disarm our police in time of war is flat out treason. Think about that. They have forgotten that we are at war. They have forgotten that we expect our cops to go in. We ex our cops will be financially and professionally destroyed. Children are being slaughtered. The cop doesn't go in. What's going to happen? It's called malfeasance and cowards. They're election of duty. We will sue them. We will fire them if they don't go in. We expect our cops to go in. You have a choice. They don't have a choice. It's their job to go in. We are at war, and they're the frontline troops in this war. And in the middle of that, people are trying to disarm our cops. And I tell you, I believe with all my heart, it's flat out treason. And people who try to disarm our citizens are equally flat out treason, because you are the second line of defense. Our strength is that we have passed the responsibility, the tools, and the training to every citizen who desires to have you are the sheep dog. You are the dog on the <laughs> And so, folks, what I want to do is talk to you about mental preparation for a moment or two. And, and uh, we talk about the tools. Other people can tell you about that. When I get a chance, I, I'm, I'm armed. I usually carry a rifle in a small bag when I when I get the option because the rifle is infinitely desirable. You want your cops to have rifles. When the cops go in to rescue your grandkids, you want them to have rifles. Uh, I want you to understand something with all your heart and soul, folks. Very, very bad crimes are done. Our kids have committed crimes of children like nothing a human can do. They're growing up together crimes we can imagine in Sandy Hook, which has to be here, yes. Gang crime and gang membership is exploding, and Mexico is our future. And the terrorists will strike again, and they will do everything in their power to destroy our way of life and drive us to our knees. They come to five daycare centers and five schools tomorrow morning. The next day, I believe not a parent of the nation will send a kid to daycare. Nine of the hijacked four planes, we shut every airport in North America. Christmas, they attacked a school in Pakistan, killed 140 people, and they shot every school in Pakistan. A hundred million kids will be loose in the streets. Schools shut, daycare centers shut. A hundred million parents will drop out of the workforce. They will destroy our way of life. They will cripple our economy. They will modify the daily behavior of every single child, every family, every community. <coughs> I believe in the end they can do more harm. In the end, they can do more harm to the individual families and cities of our nation by hitting those schools and those daycares and they can by popping the new problem in my lunch room. And you are the front line of defense. You are the ones who volunteer to accept that responsibility. And so folks, uh, what I want to do is have you wrap your mind around the model, truly, the model. Of the paladin. Not all knights were good. All paladins tried to be good. Yeah? All the 1950s TV shows have gun will travel. Remember that one? Remember that one? Yeah? Have gun will travel, reach it far, a local man. A knight without armor in a savage land. Paladin, paladin, whether to your own. Paladin, paladin. Far, far from home. They really were paladins. They woke up in the morning and they 
They picked up the life-saving tools and they went forth to administer justice and do good deeds among them. In America, you are the paladin. You are the samurai. You have the tools and the authority to use deadly force to protect yourself and the lives of others. And if you choose to be a sheepdog, and I want to talk to you about the sheepdog to lay the foundation after understanding this. So folks, uh, I'll tell you what I tell my cops, and I think it's very important. I tell my cops, uh, if you piss around, and, uh, if, you're, if you root around <laughs> in, the, in the dusty corners of every police station, you find a bunch of shooting folks. There's somebody ain't throwing them out. Cop told me a little while back, he said, we just threw away a couple hundred of those old shooting trophies. Remember those old trophies? We just threw away a couple hundred of those old shooting trophies. Going all the way back to the 1920s. You remember those trophies? <laughs> yeah. All the way back to the 1920s. Nobody wanted them. The museum didn't want them. Nobody wanted them. We threw them away. They threw away a couple hundred of those old shooting trophies. Now, do you suppose the kids who came home from World War I, did they know anything about combat? I think they did. And the kids who came home from World War II, did they know anything about combat? I think they did. And those shooting trophies of the 1920s, the 20s and the 30s, the World War I vets were going to show. And I remember right up to the 1970s, the World War II vets were going to show. The World War II vets, they were, they were our sheriffs and our, our, our chiefs, our sergeants, our captains. And here's what they all knew. If we're lucky, we'll all grow old. And we'll probably put on a little weight. Yeah. I tell my cops, have mercy on your fellow warrior, puts on a little weight. I'll be 60 next year. Keep my weight up. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. Yeah. We'll grow old. And we may grow fat. And it's okay. As long as you're still one hell of a shot. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they know. The roly-poly little guy on the pistol team was the most respected person on the department. Think about that. The roly-poly little guy on the pistol team was the most respected person on the department. Think about that. They knew that the most important skill was marksmanship. And so I tell my cops, you got to have a hobby outside this job. you got to have a hobby. It's a pure, beautiful thing when your hobby reinforces your survival skills. Hunting. I'm convinced from a lifetime of study, the single best way to prepare for combat is hunting. You don't hunt, go with your friends and do it, see what it's about. Uh, uh, competitive shooting. Uh, uh, cowboy action shooting. Airsoft and paintball. Can't buy ammo no more on the beach. Airsoft and paintball. My grandson and I in the basement. But with a pellet pistol, clink it away, find out our shot groups. I tell my cops, if your hobby doesn't provide survival skill, martial arts an incredibly valuable skill, you should be doing. I'm a big fan of the martial art called Hujutsu. Hujutsu is the martial art of the firearm. After years of work, I got my black belt in Hujutsu. You shoot for your belt. H-O-J-U-T-S-U dot com. Check it out. But martial arts, if your hobby doesn't provide survival skill, at least for the Lord's sake, let your hobby be something more cardio demands. Running. Bicycling, weightlifting, swimming, even softball, basketball, tennis has cardio demand. So I've got a motto, run through my sci-fi fantasy series. Take all the things I teach, put a little sci-fi fantasy series. It's likely true to follow Yeah, yeah. It simply says this, yeah. <laughs> Kiss on golf. <laughs> Kiss on golf, real Americans go to the range. <laughs> There's no survival skills out of the golf course. There's no cardio demands found on the golf course. For a warrior, the golf course is a willful and deliberate misuse of a perfectly good rifle range. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we are not impressed in a golf ball 200 yards. In a golf ball from 200 yards. <laughs> One minute of angle. Two inches and two hundred yards, and a bangle, one for us. Now, folks, uh, I tell my cops, if you see a fellow cop carrying golf clubs, look in the eye and tell one thing for me. <laughs> Let the sheep go graze on the golf course. We're at war. The kids overseas are fighting and dying. And we ain't got time for decadent trivial. 
You know, there's people offended by calling our cops warriors. They're warriors and you are warriors if you chose to do. Let's look up the definition of the book word warrior. Go to the dictionary, look up the word warrior. Number one. One who prepares for or participates in what? War. Are we in this war? Under the Constitution, you are if you want to be. You understand? You're in this war, you're a warrior. The second definition of warrior is even better. One who is intensely invested in a cause or a purpose. Are you intensely invested in protecting our loved ones in their hour of freedom? Are you intensely invested in protecting our nation and rising to the talent? I tell you, we need our warriors. And once again, I have no room for the pissheads who say we shouldn't call our top warriors. We're at war, and I want warriors to protect my grandchildren. And we're all on the same team. The people trying to make us hate our cops. Well, let me show you. You say, Dave, that whole this on golf thing is pretty crazy. <laughs> now, a great American president like Teddy Roosevelt, he would have never said anything like that. Oh, yeah? Here's what Teddy Roosevelt said while he was president. We should establish shooting galleries in all the large public and military schools. Should maintain national target ranges in different parts of the nation and should in every way encourage the formation of shooting clubs throughout all parts of the land. Teddy Roosevelt again said, it is unfortunately true that the great body of our citizens shoot less and less as time goes on. To meet this challenge, we should encourage practice by every means in our power. Thus, and not otherwise, may we be able to assist in preserving the peace of the world Get to hold our own against the strong nations of the earth. Our voice for peace will carry to the ends of the earth. Unprepared and therefore unfit, we must sit dumb and help us to defend ourselves, protect others, or preserve peace. The first step to avert war if possible and to be ready for war should it come is to teach our men to shoot. I had the ladies too. Oh. of exercise, I advise the good. While this gives moderate exercise to the body, it gives boldness, enterprise, and independence to the mind. Games played with the ball and others of that nature are too violent for the body and stack no character on the mind. Let your gun therefore be the cause of your head your walk. What's he saying? This on goal! <laughs> uh, how far we have come from our past. Folks, uh, England was a different nation once upon a time. Our forefathers knew that it is not enough to just have a weapon. It is also vital to be trained in the popular use of that weapon. In 1349, King Edward III of England told the citizens of London that their skill of shooting was being neglected. And he proclaimed that every one of said city, London, strong in body, or at leisure times, on holidays, used in the recreation, bows and arrows, or pellets or bolts, and learn and exercise the art of shooting, that they do not, after any manner, apply themselves to the throwing of handball, football, kemba, or cockfighting, nor such like vain plays which have no profit in them. What's he saying? He's <laughs> One last book. In 1957, or in, in 1457, King James II of Scotland banned the game of golf from the hills of which was <laughs> He argued that golf was a danger to national security as it distracted the soldiers from participating in archery. His grandson, James IV, the keen golfer, lived in the ban in 1502. Eleven years later, in the Battle of Flodden, against the English, Scotland suffered its worst ever military defeat. You know what they said? Ah, well, we wish we had said, he's on golf. Yeah. <laughs> Let me give you one last example. You know, my grandpa was a, a tried and died in the wolf Democrat. 
You love the Democratic Party. You love everything they stood for. But they no longer represent what my grandpa stood for. Here's what they were. Here's what they represent once upon a time. At the depth of the Cold War, one of our darkest hours, a president stood up and talked to the NRA. President John F. Kennedy, 1961. He came from Massachusetts, and he said, I came from the home of the Minutemen. I came from a state where armed citizens rose up and protected our nation. In the depth of the Cold War, in our darkest hour, John F. Kennedy said, today we need a nation of Minutemen. Citizens who are not only prepared to take up arms, but citizens who regard the preservation of freedom as a basic purpose of their daily life. And who are willing to consciously work and sacrifice, sacrifice for that freedom. The cause of liberty, the cause of America cannot succeed with any lesser effort. Piss on golf. <laughs> well, folks, very bad times are coming. But don't you dare not to take part. Don't you dare give up on our nation. You go home to your children and your grandchildren. You look them in the eye and you swear by all that's holy that our legacy of them will not be darkness, death, and despair. We will not be the generation that fails to pass on to our children all the blessings bestowed upon us by our forefathers. Yes. So, folks, I have a deep sense of urgency. I have a deep and profound sense of urgency. <coughs> Forty years ago, I said, 20 year old Buck Sergeant, eight second and board division. It's been over half the time in deployment. They find a wife and two babies. Thirty years ago, I said, 30 year old company commander in Panama, they find a wife, two boys. Three boys. Eighteen years ago, I retired from the Army, and truly, I've been on the road almost 300 days a year. For 18 years. This uh, July, my wife and I will have 40 years. My high school sweetheart. <laughs> My high school sweetheart, I died 40 years. I love her dearly. I love my grandbabies. But I get home one, maybe two nights a week. Can't go visit, clean underwear, back on the roof. <laughs> I have an intense sense of urgency. And I implore you to share that sense of urgency. Folks, this ain't bad. Look at 185 when they burned Washington to the ground. Look at the Civil War when killed a lot by the hundreds of thousands. Look at the horror of the trenches of World War I. Look at World War II. We fought desperately for survival on two fronts. Look at the Cold War, Korea, Vietnam, thermonuclear holocaust hanging overhead decade after decade. There have been other hard times. We made through those times because Americans stood up and sacrificed. My son just got back from a seventh combat tour. You want to feel sorry for yourself? Think about the kids over there. We ain't got it that age. Not that we go over here hard. My sacrifice, see my family one or two nights a week, that's so much. Not too much to ask. If our sacrifice hang up the golf clubs and hit the range and hit the gym and hit the dojo, that's not too much to ask. And you listen, folks. If you squirrel away 50,000 golf balls in the basement and you hit the golf course twice a year and tell us what a great golfer you are, then we all agree that nobody's impressed. <laughs> you squirt on the way 50,000 rounds of ammo in the face. You hit the range twice a year and tell us what a great warrior you are, nobody's impressed. That 50,000 rounds of ammo in the basement ain't do you no good. It's the one round right now. There's only one round in the world that counts, the one coming out the barrel right now. You can't change one before, you can't influence the one after. There's only one bullet in the world that matters, the one coming out the barrel right now. And that bullet will do what needs to be done because you fired 50,000 rounds to a fair few moment truth. Folks, we're only halfway there. We need to hit the range and, and hit the gym and kill that best of our ability to prepare for that moment of truth. Remember those World War I vets, those World War II vets? The rolling ball in little guy in the pistol team was the most respected, most respected person on the department. Okay? <laughs> We will tap into our roots and we will not give up on our nation. If your goal in life is to hunker down and rebuild a new civilization with your children, then fine. But if your goal is to defend our nation and to preserve our liberty 
like two centuries of Americans have done before, then I want to stand beside them. Don't give up on our nation. Don't you dare give up on our nation. We've seen the stock market crash. We've seen the housing market crash. We've seen the banks crash. We've seen the Twin Towers come down. We've seen our children commit crimes to children like nothing in human history. Like one of the biggest times we can imagine. We don't damn well Sandy Hook is just the beginning. That Mexico is coming unglued with more loss of life than Iraq and Afghanistan put together, and that's our future. With over a million true blue criminal gang members increasing by 100,000 a year, brainwashed from the youngest age to identify with the criminal and hate the cop. And the terrorists will strike again, and they will drive us to our knees if it's humanly possible to do something. They will murder our children, and they will destroy our real life. And there's only one human being in this universe you can control. There's only one thing on the planet you can control. Who is it? Yourself. If you give way to bitterness, if you give way to cynicism or complacency, that's the one thing we can control. And you've given the world a picture of hands that we will not give to them. It's important to be sheep on us. Now I want to talk to you about that sheep dog model. Folks, uh, an old uh, an old retired army colonel told me one time, just one sentence, and it became the whole model. I did all the writing about all this stuff. And he said, Dave, he said, most people in our society, now, a major study in World War II on Normandy Beach, after 60 days, now think about this, 60 days of continuous day in our combat at Normandy Beach, 98% of those who are left, many dead, many wounded, but of those who are left, after 60 days, 98% were literally driven crazy by combat. Their mind was the weak one. They were psychiatric evidence. I'll show you kind of a, a little slide that makes this come together. It's in my books if you want to spend more time on it. Swank and Marchand's study of World War II. After 60 days of continuous day night combat, 98% had become psychiatric evidences. They were literally driven crazy by combat. Folks, in my cops, on the beat, we lose eight times as many cops of their own head as they do for felonious attacks. Whether you're a cop on the beat, or a soldier in combat, the weak link is the monster. We can spend endless hours on the range, but we've got to have our mind ready for the moment of truth, and that's what we're going to do. So, folks, 98% of those who were left were literally driven crazy. What about the other 2%? <laughs> they were crazy when they got there. <laughs> <laughs> the World War II researchers, they lumped them together as aggressive sociopaths. But wait, wait, it's far more complex than that. The numbers can vary greatly. Hear me? All these numbers can vary greatly. But let us call it 1%. Or 1%. And the old Vietnam vet, he... Uh, he said, most people in our society are sheep. They're just kind, gentle creatures, no one to buy after for extreme provocation. And then there's the wolf. And the wolf, well, pretty the sheep without mercy. Are there wolves in the land? Are there people who will harm your children and take pleasure from doing it? Yeah, yeah. Tell it to Sandy Hook, tell it to Best Land. The moment you try to pretend, oh, there's no bad man out here. You, my friend, are in denial. And denial is the enemy. Denial turns us into sheep, yes? I, I tell my cops, I tell my citizens, if you're legally authorized to carry the life saving tools of your profession, if you're legally authorized to carry that gun, and you step out the gun, you step out the door, that's your gun. Take a deep breath and say, bah. Because <laughs> the day you chose to be a sheep, you chose to, the denial is the only difference. So there are wolves, there are sheep, and then the old boy said, there are sheep dogs. I am a predator too. I am a meat eater too. But I live to protect the flock and confront the wolf. <coughs> now, folks, uh, and we all saw the movie American Slayer. It's driven the liberals insane. <laughs> It has flat driven them insane. It represents everything they hate. 
They hated every time we told our military thanks for the service. They hated every time we told our cops thanks for the sacrifice. They hated every minute of it. They hated it. And now they're back on top. It's been 13 years. The wolf has gone away. And they're trying to shut down our cops and shut down our rights. They're, they're Uber shoot. Yeah. <laughs> they're trying to shut down our rights and shut down our cops so the bad man is not going away. And so, folks, uh, there was a, a left-wing blog in the movie, American Sniper, they used the sheepdog piece. That wasn't in the book. It, it came straight from me. Several sentences fit in my work with my permission. They, they, the whole sheepdog thing's out of my work. We got the sheepdog children's book. I'll show you in a minute. But this left-wing blog said, oh, there's no scientific proof of this. Of course. No, no, no. I beg the difference. There's a huge body of scientific evidence. Here's why this is important. Ultimately, these people are shattered by combat. These people are crazy when they got there. Yeah? If you have no propensity for violence, then you're a non-violent citizen. Yeah? When the wolf appears, you're doomed. They're in a cheap out there to protect. If you have a propensity for violence and absence of empathy, violence without empathy is a pretty good thumbnail definition of the sociopath, the psychopath, the wolf. But what if you had a propensity for violence? and the love for the lambs. What if you spent a lifetime nurturing the propensity for violence and desire to use it in a righteous battle? Now what do you have? The sheep dog, the armed American citizen, prepared for their moment of truth, prepared to lay their life on the line. Now, folks, there's a huge body of research on this. People who do not get PTSD, think about that. What kind of people don't get post-traumatic stress disorder? Holocaust survivors who walk out of Nazi death camps and upstairs, they're just fine. You believe there's such people. You spend more time in the Jewish community, you met them, huh? POWs were horribly malnourished and tortured for years. They walk out of the POW camp and upstairs, they're just fine. You believe there's such people. You bet. I met one a while back, retired Air Force General. As a young pilot had been shot down over North Vietnam. Over four years, he's a POW in North Vietnam. Four years of daily torture and malnutrition was in his life. He walked out of that POW camp and upstairs he was just fine. It took a year or two for his body to recover, but his mind was just fine. He got on with his family, got on with his career, retired with stars, better than most of us love to For him, it was just a four-year unaccompanied hardship tour. I said, General, that's resilience. That's what we study. What made that possible? Here's what it says. Every evil act the enemy inflicted upon us renewed our faith when the right side of this world came back. Every bad thing that happened in this world should renew your faith that the world needs what you have to give. You'd be like Batman. The average citizen in Gotham City sees the news, crime, death, violence. What do they do? Hunker down, hide, lock the door. Batman hears about crime and violence, what's he do? He trains his tail off. You will never find Batman on the golf course. <laughs> and then he uses his skills to hunt the Batman. You'd be like Batman. Every bad thing in the news should renew your determination and carry that gun to hit the range, to be prepared for the moment of truth. You see, the first step in resiliency, the military calls this resilience. I was the keynote speaker of the first Department of Defense Wide Resiliency Conference. I was the opening speaker, the second D Wide Resiliency Conference. Oh, believe me, we study people who do not get PTSD. We study the sheepdog. You understand? And every bad thing happens as well. should renew your faith. The sheepdog is trying to pull you down. She's step one in resiliency is motivation. The sheep are always trying to pull you down. Why do you want to carry a gun around? Uh, why do you always spend time in the rain? Uh, why won't you come play golf with us? Uh. <laughs> the sheep are trying to pull you down. You must believe in God. And every bad thing that happens in this world should be your faith. This is sometimes called the internal locus of control. Let go of all the things you can't control. It quit 
It's an unwanted about things you can't control. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear you kissing about things you can't control. Let it go. Identify the one thing in the universe you can control and do it. Yeah. Run for school board. Make sure the schools are good. Hit the range. Hit the dojo. Hit the gym. If you're ready for your moment of truth, yes. Step one of resilience is motivation. What greater motivation can be than our children? Who would not walk out that door and take a bullet for your children and your grandchildren? That's why you carry that gun every day. If people ask you why you carry that gun, you tell them. Because I couldn't live with us. Because I would live the rest of my life in hell. If children were dying and I didn't have the tools to protect them. Yes? Fire sprinklers and fire exits and fire alarms, fire drills. Yeah? Look at all the things. Half the construction cost of the building went into the fire code. But they're offended you might try to prepare for violence. They think there's something wrong with you because you carry a gun. There's nothing wrong with you. There's something wrong with the people who think there's something wrong with you. Don't you? <laughs> there's a denial. There's Steve. Now, folks, the sheep don't like having predators around. You see, what's a sheep going to do? They kill. They're a predator. You know what the wolf calls it? When a sheep tries to stand up to a bunch. <laughs> what's a wolf call when a bunch of sheep try to stand up to a buffet? <laughs> Only a predator can hunt a predator. Do we all agree on that? Yeah. What's a predator to do? They kill. Only a killer can hunt a killer. Are you spiritually, emotionally, psychologically prepared to snuff out a human life in defense of innocent lives? And I'll tell you the deep dark secret of the double psychology. Every human being is insecure. Those who can admit they're insecure are a little more secure than the others. <laughs> Within the normal bounds of human uncertainty, have you resolved in your heart that you're fully prepared to snuff out a human life in defense of innocent lives? If you can't make that decision, that's okay. You're not a bad person. You may be a superior person, but you shouldn't be carrying a gun. Because somebody who can use that gun will take it away from you and use it on your loved ones. Once you've made the decision to take a human life, you're a transformed creature. You're a predator. The sheep don't like death penalty. They don't like guns. They don't like military. They don't like war. And they sure as hell don't like the fact that you are allowed and trained and prepared to take a human life. If the sheep don't like the sheep, I'm going to tell when. When did the sudden change of mind? When the wolf shows up. Whole flock tried to hide. I have one of the oldest sheep out there. <laughs> All right, so step one of resilience is motivation. Step two is motivation turned into action. There are no ultimate sheep dogs or just people up and down the scale. On one end of the scale is denial. What? is the opposite of denial. Accept it. And if you truly accept, what will you do? Prepare. The opposite of denial is preparation. And the definition of a warrior is one who prepares for war. On one end of the scale is denial, on the other end is a warrior strength. My little grandson, my oldest grandchild is uh, he's 13 now. Ever since a little guy was three, and I go for a walk in the park a couple times a month. I'm only home one or two nights a week. But after a lifetime as a paratrooper, a lifetime as a ranger, I miss weeks in the jungle, the desert, the forest. You give me a break, I just want to get outside. Two mile gravel crack a lake outside of town. It's Arkansas, it's hot. Very hot, we're out there late, late on a Saturday night when it finally cools off. Pitch black, no street lights there. Wouldn't take the little one in harm's way. And quite a few years back now, the little guy and I are out there, smell the pine, smell the water, the charge of batteries, singing and talking, pitch black. He said, Grandpa, it's dark. Like he just now discovered. <laughs> <laughs> I told the dark to be our friend. If he'd be yeah. up in the dark, now of course I've got to go. Folks, beat me, whip me, strip me, kick me out the door naked before I'll be with my grandbaby without the tool to protect him. Of course I've got to go. I got a blade, I got a big old German shepherd, and we'll walk in the dark. <laughs> he said, Grandpa, I scary things in the night. I said, Yeah, it's us. <laughs> 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 scary things in the night. 
God, you should have helped us. <laughs> he's convinced. He's convinced. His grandpa, his dog, and he are the scariest thing to walk the night. You know what? He's right. Yeah. I, uh, I talk about our sheepdog kids book. I talk about this. I, I call it the angel of the night. Fear not the night. Fear that which walks the night. And I am that which walks the night. But only evil need fear me. And gentle souls sleep safe in their beds. Because I walk the night. Carpe noctum sees the night. Any fool can see the day. My grandson and I, we see the night. Yeah? Yeah. We've got the finest hardware. We've got the finest software. We're confident in our skills. Now, here's the point. The sheep say, well, what, what good to do to carry a gun? They come behind us here, too. Pretty good. Ever notice how the sheep come up with weird, convoluted scenarios? To prove that nothing he can do, and they're right. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They believe there's nothing they can do, and so they do nothing. The sheep dog does just the opposite. I know someone shot ten times. Deputy Jennifer Volk with Orlando Ford shot ten times. Killed the ambassador. Shot her, it's only fair. <laughs> Back on the job a year later. <clears throat> Somebody come on me and shoot me, they got a surprise cop. The sheep, in, in weird, convoluted scenarios, have proved there's nothing they can do. The sheep dog does just the opposite. Now, here's the crazy part. Even if that gun fails you, even if their worst case scenario happens, you're less likely to get PTSD. You know, I call PTSD the gift that keeps on giving, kind of like herpes. Yeah? <laughs> if you die, that's not contagious. You lose a limb, your kids can't catch that. You come up with a load of uh, emotional baggage, you're to live with it. Your loved ones, it truly can echo down across the generations. It truly can be the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah? And if we're going to come home to our loved ones and not have the gift that keeps on giving, then preparation saves us twice. <clears throat> Denial kills you twice. Denial kills you once because you don't have the gun, you don't have the skills, and you die like an other sheep. Denial kills you twice because you spend the rest of your life in hell. You know, darn well, there are simple things you could and should have done. Preparation saves you twice. It saves you once because you've got the skills, you've got the tools, and you're triumphant. But even if you fail, you can live with yourself. Because you did everything you can. You understand? There are no ultimate sheep dogs. There are just people up and down the scale. Let me show you a people up and down the scale thing. When the sheep heard about the 9-11 hijackings, they said, thank God I wasn't on that plane. When the sheep dog heard about the 9-11 hijackings, they said, maybe I could have made a difference. But he said, yeah, Dave, you got my number. Wish him that plane. Good. Shame on us to catch the same trick. You and I will get up on our plane and kick his tail. I'm on that plane every night. We'll go kick his tail. Odds are pretty good. He's going to try the same thing. Be ready in the mall. Be ready at the theater. Be ready in your house of worship. Now, folks, I teach sheepdog uh, church safety seminars on Saturdays across America. Just, just Google sheepdog church safety seminars. They'll come right up. We'll teach them across America. And we, uh, I co-trained a guy named Carl Chin, one of the definitive experts on church safety. He's been keeping track for years. Carl was one of the first, one of the armed responders in uh, New Life Church in Colorado when that man murdered two people at New Life Church. And he was stopped by armed responders. And Carl tells us that more people die by violence in houses of worship every year than they do in schools. Think about that. I showed you the school numbers, but the numbers killed in the house of worship are actually more than that. By the way, two out of three are outside in the parking lot. That divorced husband, that boyfriend of the restraining order, they know where to find their victim one day a week. It's the parking lot of the house of worship. I believe when it's legal and lawful, if your house of worship has a fire exit, a fire sprinkler, and a fire extinguisher, and they should, when it's lawful and legal, how much more so should you have the tools to protect them from violence? Yes. And so, folks, uh, most of all, you'd be ready in your kid's school. A warrior says, identify the worst thing that can happen and prepare for that person. Think about that. I'm an infantry company commander putting in a defense. 
What's the worst thing that can happen? Tanks coming down the high speed down no approach. Armor would be through us, we'd be dead, and they'd be gone. Blink an eye, 60 miles an hour. First thing to do is put up your barriers, your anti tank mines, your anti armor system, build everything else around that. Identify the worst thing that happened, prepare for that. The worst thing that happened to us as individuals, and the worst thing that happened to our nation, that will then come kill our kids. You prepare for that. You make sure your kids' daycare center is safe, and if they're not, get them out of there. Free enterprise, maybe find one that will. You make sure your kids' school is safe, and if they don't do it, run for school board. Don't you dare piss and moan about our schools until you're knee deep in school board elections. Identify the worst thing that happened and prepare for that first. Yes. And our sheep dogs are rising to the challenge. Let me tie this all up with a pop quiz. Oh no, not another two. <laughs> Identify for me the sheepdog in this photograph. A bomb has gone off the left of the screen. <coughs> the flock is getting a stampede. Now look at my sheepdog, head up, striding toward the sound of the guns. Look at my little boy, terror in his face. Here's the exact same scene a split second later. Fast as camera clicked the shutter, here they are. The flock is in full stampede. The sheepdog is striking toward the sound of the guns. That little boy, ha! They ain't no fool. <laughs> <laughs> ain't no stubborn when he sees it. You know what's better than a ceramic plate between you and a bad guy? Two ceramic plates. <laughs> Human body and a camelback between you and the bad guy. Now here's the point, folks. There's sad little people out there say, ah, oh, one man's terrorist, the other man's freedom fighter. There's no difference up there, but on the other side. Both. That little boy can build it. We say in our sheepdog Pilgrim's book, we say in the sheepdog Pilgrim's book, the wolf lives to destroy. The sheepdog lives to protect. The wolf says might makes right. The sheepdog says might alone is not strength. Compassion is not weakness. Might alone is not strength, and compassion is not weakness. The wolf, the coward, will use the lambs as human shields. The sheepdog is a human shield for the lambs. There's all the difference in the world. I believe courage and honor will defeat hate and fear every time. I believe in truth, justice, the American way. And I believe it will defeat crime and violence in the end. I believe in the redeeming power of love. And I believe sheepdogs who love their fellow citizens enough to die for them represent one of the most powerful and beautiful forces in our civilization. And you believe in who you are. You believe in what you do. Let me tell you why you're sheepdogs. Ain't nobody doing this just for the money. Cops don't do it just for the money. They're sheepdogs, because you know there's evil in the land. And you want to use your life to make the world just a little bit better for us, yes? See, the sheep are wary of the sheepdogs. We like our sheep. We like our sheep. <laughs> we like our sheep. And we'd have trouble living with ourselves, yes? We'd have trouble living with ourselves. If somebody came to kill our lambs, and we hadn't done everything we could lawfully legally do. Remember, denial kills you twice. It kills you once physically, you don't have the tools, you don't have the skills, and you die like any other sheep. It kills you twice psychologically, if you live the rest of your life in hell. Preparation saves you twice. That's the boat of mind. Those who prepare. It saves you once because you've got the skills, you've got the tools. But even if you fail, your conscience is good. You did it you can do. And our nation cries out for a protector. And I ask you to belly up to the bar. 50,000 golf balls in the basement don't make you a great golfer. No? 50,000 rounds of ammo squirreled away in the basement don't make you a great one. It's 50,000 rounds on the range that makes it straight. Yes. Prepare for a moment of truth. Rise to the challenge. Remember our green beret. Don't let those bastards come kill my kids. 
Watch my six. Come on. In the final period of time after this next break, we're going to tie together some nuts and bolts on PTSD. Best my ability to make you experts on PTSD and how not to get PTSD. Why it's important as armed citizens. I'll show you things that have been framed cops. Cops who have memory gaps and memory distortion. How much more so should it happen to us? And after you get into getting force sensitive, what are you going to say? I want my lawyer. Period. 